Hi guys. Um, so I finished another chapter in headfirst JavaScript programming. So it was chapter four, <clears throat> and it was on arrays. So it's just about using arrays in JavaScript and iterating through them. Um, they introduced the for loop. Um, <clears throat> which they said is commonly used to iterate through arrays. <clears throat> and they mentioned that a sparse array is an array that has values at only some of the indices. So if you make a new array <clears throat> and you put a value at index 0 and then you put another value at like index 10, everything in between that will be undefined. So that's a sparse array. And they just kind of mentioned to be careful of that. Uh, like if you're iterating through an array and doing something with each value, you might have to check if values are undefined before you do whatever with them if you know you have a sparse array. So it wasn't really anything new. I hadn't really heard the term sparse array before, um, but I think everything else was the same. And they didn't really go through anything that was like JavaScript specific. Um, <clears throat> like any special functions or anything for working with arrays. Uh, they mentioned that you can use um, the length property to find the size, ar size of an array, but that I've seen before in other languages, so that's really common. <clears throat> and they had a good example of um, uh, like a, a bubble factory that makes bubble mixes and having a data set that's stored in, ar in an array and then making some functions to work with that data set um, <clears throat> and printing the results to the console. So it was a repeat of an exercise from a different book. Um, but I messed around with it, I refactored it a bit. Um, uh, they kind of made like some suggestions in the book for how you might refactor it, um, but they didn't actually do it. So I went through and I did some refactoring, did some renaming, just to do a little bit of figuring out what I thought looked good and, and what I thought would work, would work, would make it more neat and more organized. Um, so I will show the examples right now. So they had this example first, just to, um, I think, get started with working with arrays. So it's just kind of a quick and this is also, I've seen this in a different book, um, but we just had this function called make phrases and uh, three arrays that have some random words or uh, words. Yeah, well, these are two words, but words and phrases and three different arrays. And then we have three random variables that um, we're selecting a random index for each array. So we're using the random function times the length of the array and then using floor to round down. And I mean they made the point that an array starts at index 0 so the length of the array will always be one more than the, than the last index <clears throat> but because we are rounding down here, it works out um, that our, our final index will be between 0 and the length of the array for each array. And then we build our phrase by getting the word from each array at the random index and putting a space in between them. <clears throat> And then we show the phrase with the alert function. Here's what we call the actual function. So, <clears throat> uh, 
if we refresh we get a random phrase That's being awfully slow here, but okay, if we do it again, another random phrase, and you can do it as many times as you want and get random phrases. So then the next example was a little bit more interesting. So we have a bubble factory, and they have scores for a bunch of different bubble solutions that they've tested. It's supposed to be, um, I think, the quantity of bubbles you can make with a certain amount of the bubble mixture. So the number is how good the solution is, and the higher the number, the better. <clears throat> so we were given um, a spec, not really a spec, but just like a rough outline of what the company wanted for an output, um, what c calculations they wanted and how they wanted it printed. So the final output we refresh here and it's all printed to the console but uh, <clears throat> we just print bubble solution the number and then the score for each one all the way down so we just format the scores a little bit differently then they want to know how many tests total we got 36 highest score we print is 69 and what solutions had that highest score. So it's 11 and 18. So if you look at the data, because there's not a whole lot of it, you can see that we did print the highest score. And you can see number 18 has that score and number 11 has that score. So to write the code to find that, So um, we're making some variables here for an output, the high score, we're going to start with zero and then we have an empty array for our best solutions. So then we're using a for loop to go through each score in the array um, using length as the, as the, the, I don't know what it's called, the limiting factor, when to stop iterating. <clears throat> We're going to set the output each time to bubble solution number plus the index plus score and then print the score. We're going to log that to the console and then to figure out the highest score we're going to say if that score is greater than our high score set that new set that score to be the new high score. So that'll find the highest score out of all the solutions. And then to find which solutions had that highest score, we had to do another for loop because we couldn't use the same one since we won't know the highest score until we are finished iterating through all the scores. So, although now that I think of it, you could, when you do this, you could have a separate, um, you could work it so you only had one loop here because you could say the high score is now equal to that score and then you could store that index in this best solutions array and then if a high score beat that high score you could clear out the array and put the new solution uh, the new index in that array you have to be careful because if more than one solution has the highest score, you don't want to override it. Um, but you also don't want to leave an index in there if it is no longer the high score. But you could you could work it so you only had one for loop if you wanted to. I do think it would probably make the code look more confusing. But I don't know about time-wise, depending on how many scores you're dealing with, the data set for the for loop, how long it takes. Maybe there would be an advantage to doing it that way. I doubt, I mean, for this small of a data set, it probably does not really matter. Um, but anyway, so we're doing it with a separate for loop. We're iterating through all the scores again. 
we're saying if the score is equal to high score, add it, add the index to the best solutions array. And then we're going to print out how many tests using the length property. The highest score is going to be our high score, and then the solutions of the highest score are going to be in this array. And this automatically prints them with a comma in between each one, which I also feel like I should point out in the book, they specified that they wanted it printed a certain way, and then we did not print it out that way, which I guess is fine. They said they wanted it to be bubble or solutions with a high score, and then they wanted it to say number 11, comma, number 18, and we ended up just printing 11 and 18 like that which works, but it's not what they specified. But if we wanted to do what they specified, I think there would be a way to do it. We would just probably need to loop through this array and concatenate the number sign to each one before printing it out. But it's probably overkill for this solution. Um, So anyway, so then they said, uh, what if we want to refactor this using functions to make it more organized? Um, so we did. And then they also threw in another calculation they wanted us to do. They wanted us to get, they added another data set of costs that coordinates with each score for how much each solution costs. They said these can be called parallel rays because they coordinate with each other. And they said they want to know the best solution with the lowest cost. So the solution with the highest score, find that first, and then look at which one of the solutions with the highest score has the lowest cost. So I did think that was a little confusing in the book because they called it the most efficient solution, I think. They kept labeling it as like, um, I don't know if they said efficient, cost efficient solution or something like that. I thought the name they picked was misleading because, <clears throat> or cost effective solution, I think they said. But if you were gonna find the cost effective solution, to me, that would mean taking the, the score and like multiplying it by the cost or dividing it um, to figure out, you know, what one gets the most bubbles per, like what, what do you get for bubble per cost? And then your most effective solution or most efficient or whatever would be some kind of factor of these two combined. Um, you know, because if you get like, if you can get like a hundred bubbles, but it costs a dollar and you get 99 bubbles and it costs 50 cents, the 99 bubbles for 50 cents is going to be a more cost effective solution versus the 100 bubbles for a dollar. Um, it's just, I just feel like it depends on what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to calculate. They, the, the way that they, the score that they ended up going with, it had to be the highest score. And then we look at the cost afterwards. So they don't care. They're, they're not, um, I don't know, they're not looking for exactly cost effective, I would say. They're looking for best solution with lowest cost. So that's what I labeled this. That's not what it was labeled in the book. <clears throat> I also think I relabeled some other functions because I thought um, it just made the code look a little cleaner. So this is what I ended up with. We got our two arrays of numbers here. And then we got some variables that we're using functions to get the values of. So uh, we got a variable for formatted scores, for the high score, for the best solutions, and for the best solution with the lowest cost. And then we're going to log all of that to the console uh, with some text explaining some of it. And then I put all my functions at the bottom. So I have all my variables grouped together, all my logs grouped together, and all my functions grouped together. 
And I put them in alphabetical order as well, because I thought that would look nice. So, <clears throat> um, I don't know if I should go through them in alphabetical order, if I should go through them in the order that they're being printed. I'll go through them alphabetically, I guess. So for best solutions, we're going to need the scores and we're going to need our high score already calculated. Which, that means you got to call your high score, I think your get high score function before you call get best solutions, but I don't know. <clears throat> I'm going to go through them in the order that they're printed because that makes more sense to me. So formatted scores first. So get formatted scores. I made an empty string called formatted scores. Went through each um, index in the, the scores array and then added to that. This is going to be a string now. Um, added bubble solution number, the index, and then the score, and then a new line at the end. So we get a nice long paragraph of all the scores, and then we return the formatted scores. So that when we call console.log, it prints all the formatted scores. And here's the refactored one. So we're printing all the formatted scores. It looks just the same as before. And then we call high score, get high score, passing in scores. So we go to get high score. We start with a variable of zero for high score. And then we loop through the scores array and we check whether the score we're looking at is higher than our current high score. And if it is, we store that as the, the new high score. And at the end, we return the highest score. I did think there would probably be a max um, property, just like there's a length property for an array. <clears throat> I thought there would be a max one, because that you know is something that I've seen in other languages. I tried to do scores.max, and that did not work. Uh, and then I didn't go any farther than that. I feel like there is probably something like that though. Maybe it's a function or something. Maybe I just didn't call it right. Um, but I, I didn't look farther into it because I figured, I don't know, the point of this exercise was to figure out how to find the highest score ourselves with a function. So I might as well just do it that way. <clears throat> but I feel like there probably is an easier way to do that. I wonder if I tried that right now, if I said scores.max. Ah, see it turned blue, so I think that's, I think that's a thing because I've seen that in other languages that length is a property, but I think everything else is a function or something like that. So just to see how this works. Again, plus scores dot max. Okay, well it turned blue, so I thought, oh, maybe I need, scores to be passed in? <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, hmm, but we're calling scores.max, what if it's just max like that? No. I do think there's probably a way to do that. I just don't know what it is. What if it's just array.max? 
No, I'll stop guessing. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> um. So then we're gonna do the, find the best solutions. So those solutions with the highest score. So we call get best solutions, passing in the scores and the high score. And that's right here. So we start with an empty array called best scores. Loop through all our scores. Say if that score is equal to the high score, put that index into this best solutions array and then return that array. Mm -hmm. And then for finding the best solution with the lowest cost, I have this really long named thing here, which I don't know. Uh, it's descriptive at least, but uh, get best solution with lowest cost, passing in scores, costs, and high score. Um, so we're going to start out with a cost of 100 just because that's higher than any of the scores in our array. Uh, with an index variable, we're just going to declare an index variable. We're going to loop through the scores array and say if that score is equal to the high score and if the cost of that score is less than our current cost, then that is going to be our new cost. Maybe we should label this lowest cost or something instead of just cost. But that's going to become the new lowest cost. Our index is going to keep track of what, what solution that was. And then at the end, we're going to return the index. So we don't actually care about the cost right now. Although I guess we could get that using the index. And then we just print out bubble solution number with the index to indicate the best solution with the lowest cost. So, yeah, that was pretty good. It was kind of interesting to refactor it, try to come up with what I thought were better names and a better organization pattern. Because I think like they had uh, best result like best uh, get best results they called this function and I thought well we're labeling it as best solutions why don't we just label it guess get best solutions so I kind of I tried to make these all <clears throat> uniform so that the variable would match up with the get function and then I tried to make they had um so that one thing they had two of them combined oh and this was uh, print scores and get high score they had that as one function and they said if we wanted to make it a better code we could split them up into two functions but they didn't they chose not to do that so i thought i'd do that anyway so they had this print scores they had the function actually printing the score itself instead of and then it didn't return anything it just printed uh it just printed it here so th th this would just be it says the output i think and then we did console.log output each time we loop through. Um, I didn't like that because none of the other functions were printing anything themselves. They were all returning their value. So, I mean, it was called print scores, so at least it was descriptive. Um, but I just figured because everything else was returning the value instead of printing it itself, it made sense to have this one return the value as well. And then we could print them all in one place down here. So, I don't know. That made sense to me. I could see multiple ways of doing it would also make sense. But I just tried to figure out something that made sense for me right now. <clears throat> um, so the next chapter is on objects. So, that should be good. Maybe we get some more information there about objects in JavaScript, um, but that's going to be it for now, so uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>